Hello friends, I am Marcus, and I welcome you to this original calm narration of the short stories of the life book of Uncle Jesse and Uncle Richard's New Year's Dinner by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Let us unwind. Find a peaceful, comfortable, and safe place to relax. Your bed, your sofa, your favorite chair. And let us begin this story. The Life Book of Uncle Jesse Uncle Jesse, the name calls up the vision of him as I saw him so often in those two enchanted summers at Golden Gate. As I saw him the first time, when he stood in the open doorway of the little low-eaved cottage on the harbor shore, welcoming us to our new domicile with the gentle, unconscious courtesy that became him so well. A tall, ungainly figure, somewhat stooped, yet suggestive of great strength and endurance. A clean-shaven old face, deeply lined and bronzed. A thick mane of irony gray hair, falling quite to his shoulders and a pair of remarkably blue, deep-set eyes, which sometimes twinkled and sometimes dreamed, but oftener looked out seaward with a wistful question in them, as of one seeking something precious and lost. I was to learn one day what it was for which Uncle Jesse looked. It cannot be denied, that Uncle Jesse was a homely man. His bare jaws, rugged mouth, and square brow were not fashioned on the lines of beauty. But though at first sight you thought him plain, you never thought anything more about it. The spirit shining through that rugged tenement beautified it so wholly. Uncle Jesse was quite keenly aware of his lack of outward comeliness, and lamented it, for he was a passionate worshipper of beauty in everything. He told mother once that he'd rather like to be made over again and made handsome. Folks say I'm good, he remarked whimsically, but I sometimes wish the Lord had made me only half as good and put the rest of it into looks. But I reckon he knew what he was about, as a good captain should. Some of us have to be homely or pretty ones, like Miss Mary there, wouldn't show up so well. I was not in the least pretty, but Uncle Jesse was always telling me I was. And I loved him for it. He told the fib so prettily, and sincerely that he almost made me believe it for the time being, and I really think he believed it himself. All women were lovely and of good report in his eyes, because of one he had loved. The only time I ever saw Uncle Jesse really angered was when someone in his hearing cast an aspersion on the character of a shore girl. The wretched man who did it fairly cringed when Uncle Jesse turned on him with lightning of eye and thundercloud of brow. At that moment I no longer found it hard to reconcile Uncle Jesse's simple, kindly personality with the wild, adventurous life he had lived. We went to Golden Gate in the spring. Mother's health had not been good, and her doctor recommended sea air and quiet. Uncle James, when he heard it, proposed that we take possession of a small cottage at Golden Gate, to which he had recently fallen heir 
by the death of an old aunt who had lived in it. I haven't been up to see it, he said, but it is just as Aunt Elizabeth left it, and she was the pink of neatness. The key is in the possession of an old sailor living nearby. Jesse Boyd is the name, I think. I imagine you can be very comfortable in it. It is built right on the harbor shore, inside the bar, and it is within five minutes' walk of the outside shore. Uncle James's offer fitted in very opportunely with our limp family purse, and we straightway betook ourselves to Golden Gate. We telegraphed to Jesse Boyd to have the house opened for us, and one crisp spring day, when a rollicking wind was scudding over the harbor and the dunes, whipping the water into whitecaps and washing the sand shore with long lines of silvery breaks, we alighted at the little station and walked the half mile to our new home leaving our goods and chattels to be carted over in the evening by an obliging station agent's boy. Our first glimpse of Aunt Elizabeth's cottage was a delight to soul and sense. It looked so like a big grey seashell stranded on the shore. Between it and the harbour was only a narrow strip of shingle and behind it was a gnarled and battered fir wood where the winds were in the habit of harping all sorts of weird and haunting music. Inside it was to prove even yet more quaint and delightful, with its low, dark-beamed ceilings and square, deep-set windows by which, whether open or shut, sea breezes entered at their own sweet well. The view from our door was magnificent, taking in the big harbor and sweeps of purple hills beyond. The entrance of the harbor gave it its name, a deep, narrow channel between the bar of sand dunes on the one side and a steep, high, frowning red sandstone cliff on the other. We appreciated its significance and the first time we saw a splendid golden sunrise flooding it, coming out of the wonderful sea and sky beyond, and billowing through that narrow passage in waves of light. Truly it was a golden gate through which one might sail to fairy lands forlorn. As we went along the path to our little house, we were agreeably surprised to see a blue spiral of smoke curling up from its big square chimney. And the next moment, Uncle Jesse, we were calling him Uncle Jesse half an hour after we met him, so it seemed scarcely worthwhile to begin with anything else, came to the door. Welcome, ladies, he said holding out a big, hard, but scrupulously clean hand. I thought you'd be feeling a bit tired and hungry, maybe, so when I came over to open up, I put on a fire and brewed up a cup of tea. I just delight in being neighborly, and taint often I have the chance. We found that Uncle Jesse's cup of tea meant a veritable spread. He had aired the little dining room, set out the table daintily with Aunt Elizabeth's china and linen. Know just where to put my hands on them, often and often helped old Miss Kennedy wash them. We were cronies, her and me, I miss her terrible. And adorned it with mayflowers, which, as we afterwards discovered, he had tramped several miles to gather. There was good bread and butter, store biscuits, a dish of tea fit for the gods on high Olympus, and a platter of the most delicious sea trout, done to a turn. Thought they'd be tasty after traveling, said Uncle Jesse. They're fresh as trout can be, ma'am. Two hours ago they were swimming in Johnson's Pond yonder. I caught them. Yes, ma'am. 
It's about all I'm good for now, catching trout and cod occasionally. But to weren't always so, not by no manners of means. I used to do other things, as you'd admit if you saw my life book. I was so hungry and tired that I did not then rise to the bait of Uncle Jesse's life book. I simply wanted to begin on those trout. Mother insisted that Uncle Jesse sit down and help us eat the repast he had prepared, and he assented without undue coaxing. Thank you kindly. It will be a real treat. I mostly has to eat my meals alone, with the reflection of my ugly old fizz in a looking glass opposite for company. Tisn't often I have the chance to sit down with two such sweet pretty ladies. Uncle Jesse's compliments look bald enough on paper, but he paid them with such gracious, gentle deference of tone and look, that the woman who received them felt that she was being offered a queen's gift in kingly fashion. He broke bread with us, and from that moment we were all friends together and for ever. After we had eaten all we could, we sat at our table for an hour and listened to Uncle Jesse telling us stories of his life. If I talk too much, you must just check me, he said seriously, but with a twinkle in his eyes. When I get a chance to talk to anyone, I'm apt to run on terrible. He had been a sailor, from the time he was ten years old, and some of his adventures had such a marvelous edge that I secretly wondered if Uncle Jesse were not drawing a rather long bow at our credulous expense. But in this, as I found later, I did him injustice. His tales were all literally true, and Uncle Jesse had the gift of the born storyteller, whereby unhappy, far-off things, can be brought vividly before the hearer and made to live again in all the pristine poignancy. Mother and I laughed and shivered over Uncle Jesse's tales, and once we found ourselves crying. Uncle Jesse surveyed our tears with pleasure shining out through his face like an illuminating lamp. I like to make folks cry that way, he remarked. It's a compliment, but I can't do justice to the things I have seen and helped do. I've got them all jotted down in my life book, but I haven't got the knack of writing them out properly. If I had, I could make a great book. If I had the knack of hitting on just the right words and stringing everything together proper on paper. But I can't. It's in this poor human critter. Uncle Jesse patted his breast sorrowfully, but he can't get it out. When Uncle Jesse went home that evening, Mother asked him to come often to see us. I wonder if you'd give that invitation if you knew how likely I'd be to accept it, he remarked whimsically. Which is another way of saying you wonder if I meant it, smiled Mother. I do most heartily and sincerely. Then I'll come. You'll likely be pestered with me at any hour, and I be proud to have you drop over to visit me now and then too. I live on that point yonder. Neither me nor my house is worth coming to see. It's only got one room and a loft and a stovepipe sticking out of the roof for a chimney but I've got a few little things lying around that I picked up in the queer corners I used to be poking my nose into. Maybe they'd interest you. Uncle Jesse's few little things turned out to be the most interesting collection of curious I had ever seen. His one neat little living room was full of them. Beautiful, hideous, or quaint, as the case might be, and almost all having some weird or exciting story attached. Mother and I had a beautiful summer at Golden Gate, 
we lived the life of two children with Uncle Jesse as playmate. Our housekeeping was of the simplest description, and we spent our hours rambling along the shores, reading on the rocks or sailing over the harbor in Uncle Jesse's trim little boat. Every day we loved the simple-souled, true, manly old sailor more and more. He was as refreshing as a sea breeze, as interesting as some ancient chronicle. We never tired of listening to his stories and his quaint remarks and comments were a continual delight to us. Uncle Jesse was one of those interesting and rare people who, in the picturesque phraseology of the shore folks, never speak, but they say something. The milk of human kindness and the wisdom of the serpent were mingled in Uncle Jesse's composition in delightful proportions. One day, he was absent all day and returned at nightfall. Took a tramp back yonder. Back yonder, with Uncle Jesse, might mean the station hamlet or the city a hundred miles away, or any place between. To carry Mr. Kimball a mess of trout. He likes one occasional, and it's all I can do for a kindness he did me once. I stayed all day to talk to him. He likes to talk to me, though he's an educated man, because he's one of the folks who's got to talk or they're miserable, and he finds listeners scars around here. The folks fight shy of him, because they think he's an infidel. He ain't that far gone exactly, few men is, I reckon, but he's what you might call a heretic. Heretics are wicked, but they're mighty interesting. It's just that they've got sort of lost looking for God, being under the impression that he's hard to find, which he ain't, never. Most of them blunder to him after a while, I guess. I don't think listening to Mr. Kimball's arguments is likely to do me much harm. Mind you, I believe what I was brought up to believe, it saves a vast of trouble. And back of it all, God is good. The trouble with Mr. Kimball is, he's a little too clever. He thinks he's bound to live up to his cleverness, and that it's smarter to thrash out some new way of getting to heaven than to go by the old track, the common, ignorant folks is traveling. But he'll get there some time, all right. And then, He'll laugh at himself. Nothing ever seemed to put Uncle Jesse out or depress him in any way. I've kind of contracted a habit of enjoying things, he remarked once, when Mother had commented on his invariable cheerfulness. It's got so chronic that I believe I even enjoy the disagreeable things. It's great fun thinking they can't last. Old rheumatism. I says, when it grips me hard, you've got to stop aching sometime. The worse you are, the sooner you'll stop, perhaps. I'm bound to get the better of you in the long run, whether in the body or out of the body. Uncle Jesse seldom came to our house without bringing us something, even if it were only a bunch of sweet grass. I favor the smell of sweetgrass, he said. It always makes me think of my mother. She was fond of it. Not that I knows on. Do knows she ever saw any sweetgrass? No, it's because it has a kind of motherly perfume, not too young. You understand, something kind of seasoned and wholesome and dependable, just like a mother. Uncle Jesse was a very early riser. He seldom missed the sunrise. I've seen all kinds of sunrises come in through that there gate, he said dreamily one morning when I myself had made a heroic effort at early rising, and joined him on the rocks halfway between his house and ours. I've been all over the world, and... 
Take it all in all, I've never seen a finer sight than a summer sunrise out there beyond the gate. A man can't pick his time for dying, Mary. Just got to go when the captain gives his sailing orders. But if I could, I'd go out when the morning comes, in there at the gate. I've watched it a many times and thought what a thing it would be to pass out through that great white glory to whatever was waiting beyond, on a sea that ain't mapped out on any earthly chart. I think, Mary, I'd find lost Margaret there. He had already told me the story of lost Margaret, as he always called her. He rarely spoke of her, but when he did, his love for her trembled in every tone. A love that had never grown faint or forgetful. Uncle Jesse was seventy. It was fifty years since lost Margaret had fallen asleep one day in her father's dory and drifted, as was supposed, for nothing was ever known certainly of her fate. Across the harbor and out of the gate, to perish in the black thunder squall that had come up suddenly that long ago afternoon. But to Uncle Jesse those fifty years were but as yesterday, when it is past. I walked ashore for months after that, he said sadly, looking to find her dear, sweet little body. But the sea never gave her back to me. But I'll find her sometime. I wished I could tell you just how she looked, but I can't. I've seen a fine silvery mist hanging over the gate at sunrise that seemed like her. And then again, I've seen a white birch in the woods back yonder that make me think of her. She had pale brown hair and a little white face and long slender fingers, like yours, Mary, only browner, for she was a shore girl. Sometimes I wake up in the night and hear the sea calling to me in the old way, and it seems as if lost Margaret called in it. And when there's a storm and the waves are sobbing and moaning, I hear her lamenting among them. And when they laugh on a gay day, it's her laugh, lost Margaret's sweet little laugh. The sea took her from me, but some day I'll find her, Mary. It can't keep us apart forever. I had not been long at Golden Gate before I saw Uncle Jesse's life book, as he quaintly called it. He needed no coaxing to show it, and he proudly gave it to me to read. It was an old leather-bound book, filled with the record of his voyages and adventures. I thought what a veritable treasure trove it would be to a writer. Every sentence was a nugget. In itself, the book had no literary merit. Uncle Jesse's charm of storytelling failed him when he came to pen and ink. He could only jot down roughly the outlines of his famous tales, and both spelling and grammar were sadly askew. But I felt that if anyone possessing the gift could take that simple record of a brave, adventurous life, Reading between the bald lines, the tale of dangers, staunchly faced and duties manfully done, a wonderful story might be made from it. Pure comedy and thrilling tragedy were both lying hidden in Uncle Jesse's life book, waiting for the touch of the magician's hand to awaken the laughter and grief and horror of thousands. I thought of my cousin, Robert Kennedy, who juggled with words in a masterly fashion, but complained that he found it hard to create incidents or characters. Here were both ready to his hand, but Robert was in Japan in the interests of his paper. In the fall, when the harbor lay black and sullen under November skies, Mother and I went back to town parting with Uncle Jesse regretfully. 
We wanted him to visit us in town during the winter, but he shook his head. It's too far away, Mary. If lost Margaret called me, I mightn't hear her there. I must be here when my time comes. It can't be very far off now. I wrote often to Uncle Jesse through the winter and sent him books and magazines. He enjoyed them, but he thought, and truly enough, that none of them came up to his life book for real interest. If my life book could be took and writ by someone that knew how, it would beat them holler. He wrote in one of his few letters to me. In the spring, we returned joyfully to Golden Gate. It was as golden as ever, and the harbor as blue. The winds, still rollicking, as gaily and sweetly, and the breakers boomed outside the bar, as of yore. All was unchanged, save Uncle Jesse. He had aged greatly, and seemed frail, and bent. After he had gone home from his first call on us, Mother cried. Uncle Jesse will soon be going to seek lost Margaret, she said. In June, Robert came. I took him promptly over to see Uncle Jesse, who was very much excited when he found that Robert was a real writing man. Robert wants to hear some of your stories, Uncle Jesse, I said. Tell him the one about the captain who went crazy and imagined he was the Flying Dutchman. This was Uncle Jesse's best story. It was a compound of humor and horror, and though I had heard it several times, I laughed as heartily and shivered as fearsomely over it as Robert did. Other tales followed. Uncle Jesse told how his vessel had been run down by a steamer, how he had been boarded by Malay pirates, how his ship had caught fire, how he had helped a political prisoner escape from a South American republic. He never said a boastful word, but it was impossible to help seeing what a hero the man had been. Brave, true, resourceful, unselfish, skillful. He sat there in his poor little room and made those things live again for us. By a lift of the eyebrow, a twist of the lip, a gesture, a word, he painted some whole scene or character so that we saw it as it was. Finally, he lent Robert his life book. Robert sat up all night reading it and came to the breakfast table in great excitement. Mary, this is a wonderful book. If I could take it and grab it properly, work it up into a systematic whole, and string it on the thread of Uncle Jesse's romance to Lost Margaret, it would be the novel of the year. Do you suppose he would let me do it? Let you? I think he would be delighted, I answered. And he was. He was as excited as a schoolboy over it. At last, his cherished dream was to be realized and his life book given to the world. We'll collaborate, said Robert. You will give the soul and I the body. Oh, we'll write a famous book between us, Uncle Jesse, and we'll get right to work. Uncle Jesse was a happy man that summer. He looked upon the little back room we gave up to Robert for a study as a sacred shrine. Robert talked everything over with Uncle Jesse, but would not let him see the manuscript. You must wait till it is published, he said. Then you'll get it all at once in its best shape. Robert delved into the treasures of the life book and used them freely. He dreamed and brooded over lost Margaret until she became a vivid reality to him and lived in his pages. As the book progressed, it took possession of him, and he worked at it with feverish eagerness. He let me read the manuscript and criticize it, and the concluding chapter of the book 
which the critics later on were pleased to call idyllic, was modelled after my suggestions, so that I felt as if I had a share in it too. It was autumn when the book was finished. Robert went back to town, but Mother and I decided to stay at Golden Gate all winter. We loved the spot, and, besides, I wished to remain for Uncle Jesse's sake. He was failing all the time. And after Robert went and the excitement of the bookmaking was past, he failed still more rapidly. His tramping expeditions were over, and he seldom went out in his boat. Neither did he talk a great deal. He liked to come over and sit silently for hours at our seaward window, looking out wistfully toward the gate, with his swiftly whitening head leaning on his hand. The only keen interest he still had was in Robert's book. He waited and watched impatiently for its publication. I want to live till I see it, he said. Just that long. Then I'll be ready to go. He said it would be out in the spring. I must hang on till it comes, Mary. There were times when I doubted sadly if he would hang on. As the winter wore away, he grew frailer and frailer. But ever he looked forward to the coming of spring and the book, his book transformed and glorified. One day, in young April, the book came at last. Uncle Jesse had gone to the post office, faithfully, every day for a month, expecting it, but this day he was too feeble to go, and I went for him. The book was there. It was called simply The Life Book of Jesse Boyd and on the title page the names of Robert Kennedy and Jesse Boyd were printed as collaborators. I shall never forget Uncle Jesse's face as I handed it to him. I came away and left him reading it, oblivious to all else. All night the light burned in his window, and I looked out across the sands to it and pictured the delight of the old man poring over the printed pages, whereon his own life was portrayed. I wondered how he would like the ending, the ending I had suggested. I was never to know. After breakfast, I went over to Uncle Jesse's house, taking some little delicacy Mother had cooked for him. It was an exquisite morning, full of delicate spring tints and sounds. The harbor was sparkling and dimpling like a girl. The winds were playing hide-and-seek roguishly among the stunted firs, and the silver-flashing gulls were soaring over the bar. Beyond the gate was a shining, wonderful sea. When I reached the little house on the point, I saw the lamp still burning vainly in the window. A quick alarm struck at my heart. Without waiting to knock, I lifted the latch and entered. Uncle Jesse was lying on the old sofa by the window, with the book clasped to his heart. His eyes were closed, and on his face was a look of the most perfect peace and happiness. The look of one who was long sought and found at last. We could not know at what hour he had died, but somehow I think he had his wish and went out when the morning came in through the golden gate. Out on that shining tide his spirit drifted, over the sunrise sea of pearl and silver, to the haven where lost Margaret waited, beyond the storms and calms. Uncle Richard's New Year's Dinner Chrissy Baker was in Oscar Miller's store New Year's morning, buying matches. For New Year's was not kept as a business holiday in Quincy, when her uncle, Richard Baker, 
came in. He did not look at Prissy, nor did she wish him a happy new year. She would not have dared. Uncle Richard had not been on speaking terms with her or her father, his only brother, for eight years. He was a big, ruddy, prosperous-looking man, an uncle to be proud of, Prissy thought wistfully. If only he were like other people's uncles, or, indeed, like what he used to be himself. He was the only uncle Prissy had, and when she had been a little girl, they had been great friends, but that was before the quarrel, in which Prissy had had no share, to be sure, although Uncle Richard seemed to include her in his rancor. Richard Baker, so he informed Mr. Miller, was on his way to Navarre with a load of pork. I didn't intend going over until the afternoon, he said, but Joe Hemming sent word yesterday he wouldn't be buying pork after twelve today. So I have to tote my hogs over at once. I don't care about doing business New Year's morning. Should think New Year's would be pretty much the same as any other day to you, said Mr. Miller, for Richard Baker was a bachelor with only old Mrs. Janeway to keep house for him. Well, I always like a good dinner on New Year's, said Richard Baker. It's about the only way I can celebrate. Mrs. Janeway wanted to spend the day with her son's family over at Oriental. So I was laying out to cook my own dinner. I got everything ready in the pantry last night. For I got word about the pork. I won't get back from Navarre before one o'clock, so I reckon I'll have to put up with a cold bite. After her uncle Richard had driven away, Prissy walked thoughtfully home. She had planned to spend a nice, lazy holiday with the new book her father had given her at Christmas and a box of candy. She did not even mean to cook a dinner for her father had had to go to town that morning to meet a friend and would be gone the whole day. There was nobody else to cook dinner for. Prissy's mother had died when Prissy was a baby. She was her father's housekeeper, and they had jolly times together. But as she walked home, she could not help thinking about Uncle Richard. He would certainly have cold New Year cheer enough to chill the whole coming year. She felt sorry for him, picturing him returning from Navarre, cold and hungry, to find a fireless house and an uncooked dinner in the pantry. Suddenly an idea popped into Prissy's head. Dared she? Oh, she never could. But he would never know. There would be plenty of time. She would. Prissy hurried home, put her matches away, took a regretful peep at her unopened book, then locked the door and started up the road to Uncle Richard's house half a mile away. She meant to go and cook Uncle Richard's dinner for him, get it all beautifully ready, then slip away before he came home. He would never suspect her of it. Prissy would not have him suspect for the world. She thought he would be more likely to throw a dinner of her cooking out of doors than to eat it. Eight years before this, when Prissy had been nine years old, Richard and Irvin Baker had quarreled over the division of a piece of property. The fault had been mainly on Richard's side and the very fact made him all the more unrelenting and stubborn. He had never spoken to his brother since, and he declared he never would. Prissy and her father felt very badly over it. But Uncle Richard did not seem to feel badly at all. 
To all appearance, he had completely forgotten that there were such people in the world as his brother Irving and his niece Prissy. Prissy had no trouble in breaking into Uncle Richard's house, for the woodshed door was unfastened, and she tripped into the hostile kitchen with rosy cheeks and mischief sparkling in her eyes. This was an adventure. This was fun. She would tell her father all about it when he came home at night, and what a laugh they would have. There was still a good fire in the stove, and in the pantry Prissy found the dinner in its raw state, a fine roast of fresh pork, potatoes, cabbage, turnips, and the ingredients of a raisin pudding for Richard Baker was fond of raisin puddings, and could make them as well as Mrs. Janeway could, if that was anything to boast of. In a short time, the kitchen was full of bubbling and hissing and appetizing odors. Prissy enjoyed herself hugely, and the raisin pudding, which she rather doubtfully mixed up, behaved itself beautifully. Uncle Richard said he'd be home by one, said Prissy to herself, as the clock struck twelve. So I'll set the table now, dish up the dinner, and leave it where it will keep warm until he gets here, and then I'll slip away home. I'd like to see his face when he steps in. I suppose he'll think one of the Jenner girls across the street has cooked his dinner. Prissy soon had the table set, and she was just peppering the turnips when a gruff voice behind her said, Well, well, what does this mean? Prissy whirled around as if she had been shot, and there stood Uncle Richard in the woodshed door. Poor Prissy, she could not have looked or felt more guilty if Uncle Richard had caught her robbing his desk. She did not drop the turnips for a wonder, but she was too confused to set them down. So she stood there holding them, her face crimson, her heart thumping, and a horrible choking in her throat. I, I came up to cook your dinner for you, Uncle Richard, she stammered. I heard you say in the store that Mrs. Janeway had gone home and that you had nobody to cook your New Year's dinner for you, so I thought I'd come and do it, but I meant to slip away before you came home. Poor Percy felt that she would never get to the end of her explanation. Would Uncle Richard be angry? Would he order her from the house? It was very kind of you said Uncle Richard dryly. It's a wonder your father let you come. Father was not home, but I am sure he would not have prevented me if he had been. Father has no hard feelings against you, Uncle Richard. Ha, ah, said Uncle Richard. Well, since you've cooked the dinner, you must stop and help me eat it. It smells good, I must say. Mrs. Chainway always burns pork when she roasts it. Sit down, Prissy, I'm hungry. They sat down. Prissy felt quite giddy and breathless, and could hardly eat for excitement. But Uncle Richard had evidently brought home a good appetite from Navarre, and he did full justice to his New Year's dinner. He talked to Prissy too, quite kindly and politely, and when the meal was over, he said slowly, I'm much obliged to you, Prissy, and I don't mind owning to you that I'm sorry for my share in the quarrel and have wanted for a long time to be friends with your father again. But I was too ashamed and proud to make the first advance. You can tell him so for me if you like and if he's willing to let bygones be bygones. Tell him I'd like him to come up here with you tonight when he gets home and spend the evening with me. 
Oh, he will come, I know, cried Prissy joyfully. He has felt so badly about not being friendly with you, Uncle Richard. I'm as glad as can be. Prissy ran impulsively around the table and kissed Uncle Richard. He looked up at his tall, girlish niece with a smile of pleasure. You're a good girl, Prissy, and a kind-hearted one, too, or you'd never have come up here to cook a dinner for a crabbed old uncle who deserved to eat cold dinners for his stubbornness. It made me cross today when folks wished me a happy new year. It seemed like mockery when I hadn't a soul belonging to me to make it happy. But it has brought me happiness already, and I believe it will be a happy year all the way through. Indeed it will, laughed Percy. I'm so happy now I could sing. I believe it was an inspiration, my idea of coming up here to cook your dinner for you. You must promise to come and cook my New Year's dinner for me every New Year we live near enough together, said Uncle Richard. And Prissy promised. <laughs>